thought experiments can be a fun way of illustrating a problem. Often they're used to make clear just how bad a situation is that we have otherwise taken for granted as normal, or at least as a problem we've downplayed in severity. I'll give you an example. Suppose we were to take a Catholic from 100 years ago and hop into Doc Brown's DeLorean and bring them to Earth in 2019. Let's say we did that with a figure like, oh, I don't know, Hilaire Belloc, and we showed him the state of the church today. <laughs> the reaction would probably be priceless if it didn't kill him from shock and heartbreak. All the moral issues aside, having a Roman pontiff who actively promotes globalism would, promote, would break the heart of any Catholic who was reasonably well-versed in the teachings of the church regarding the state and the dangers of government power. And yet our situation is such today that most of us aren't really all that surprised when we hear Francis pushing globalism from his position of authority within the church. He's practically been doing it since day one of his pontificate. In his encyclical Laudato Si, he openly advocates for the creation of a global enforcement agency for UN sustainable development programs that would have power over national governments. And he released that document four years ago. So we shouldn't be surprised by these calls for globalism. But a traveler from a bygone era would be dumbfounded by what he saw on that front alone. If we wanted to kill our fictional time-traveling Hilaire Belloc, we might show him a Morris Letizia or the Instrumentum Laboris of the Amazon Synod. But that is the state of things today, with the Roman pontiff going well beyond calling for international cooperation by states on issues with international impact in the name of peace. You may have heard the statements made by Pope Francis about the United Nations. They're often getting quoted out of context, though frankly the context doesn't seem to be helping the message at all. Here is some context for you. The Pope was speaking about the issue of U.S. and U.K. military bases in the Indian Ocean, and the U.K. has ruled that those countries must turn the territories over to the historical claimants for those territories, including the Navy bases on those islands. To this, Pope Francis chimed in for some reason and said, quote, When we recognize international organizations, we give them the capacity to judge internationally. When they speak, if we are part of humanity, we must obey. It is true that it is not, all, not always the thing that seems just for all humanity or for our pockets, but you must obey the international institutions, he said. This is why they were created. End quote. Now, on the surface, it seems like these statements were made aimed at the governments of the United States and of the United Kingdom, with the U.S. at the very least we know Francis has little love for. But again, he said that if we are part of humanity, we must obey the international institutions. And that means we must obey the U.N., apparently. And that is a naked endorsement of a one-world government, and it points to this agenda of promoting global governments, governance. As usual, Francis made these statements during a papal press conference aboard his aircraft, a, hope, a, a process that I hope his successors completely abandon. These statements are getting little coverage in the Catholic press. Many of you probably saw Michael Matt's video from the Remnant on the issue. Aside from the Remnant's coverage, the only other Catholic organization that I could quickly find covering this was the National Catholic Reporter and I had to stretch the definition of Catholic to include them. Now that fish wrapper, which has numerous times been told by Rome to cease and desist calling itself Catholic because it promotes unbridled modernism, focused its reports on this to the nuts and bolts of a territorial dispute involving the U.S., U.K., and the Chagos Islands. Now, I don't find that to be particularly interesting, and I'm sure you don't either, but if you do, you can find a link to that story on the Sources blog in my podcast show notes for this podcast. Either way, the important thing with this story wasn't actually included by the author of this piece, and that bit of important news is this. There is a greater context to what Francis is pushing for, and it's a global, standardized education. Last Friday, LifeSite News released a story that flew under the radar given the madness coming out of the Amazon, and the German Bishops' Conference being on the verge of schism, and that's a story that I'll cover tomorrow. That story is about the push by Francis for a global compact on education for a new humanism. Those are his words, not mine, and boy, are they weird coming from a Roman pontiff. The Vatican will be hosting yet another questionable event. Starting on May 14th in the year 2020, the Vatican will host a forum called Reinventing the Global Educational Alliance. The Vatican issued a statement on September 12th stating that the Pope is inviting figures of the world's largest religions, more of those NGOs the Germans love so much, and various humanitarian institutions, whatever that means, as well as what they are calling key figures from the world of politics, economics, and academia, which probably means the most annoying public figures that push global leftism, as well as prominent athletes, scientists, and sociologists, who will all be expected to sign a global pact on education so as to hand on to younger generations a united and fraternal common home. And as an aside, there's something I find delightful in 
athletes being lumped in with sociologists there. But anyway, again, those are the words of the Vatican, though. But it's not my characterization of this. Weird how the Vatican document is filled with Masonic language, right? And I could go on and discuss the need to reform education around the world, but instead I'll focus on this instead. Let's get into some tinfoil hat territory, because frankly, there's only one thing I think of when I see this kind of thing being pushed by Francis and his allies in Rome, and that's the permanent instruction of the Alta Vendita. Well, I know that some of you don't like when I read to you various things. On weekends, I upload important documents from our past that Catholics should know about and be familiar with. I've only done two or three documents written by enemies of Christ and his church, and one of those is the permanent instruction of the Alta Vendita. It's linked in the comments below. If you don't know what that document is, in short, it's a Masonic document that was intercepted by the hierarchy of the church and given to Pius IX who, along with Leo XIII later on, would publish it at their own expense and have it promulgated in various languages around the world. Its authors were Italian members of the Lodge. One key passage jumps out, and I'll quote it here. Quote, We do not intend to win the popes to our cause, to make them neophytes of our principles, propagators of our ideas. That would be a ridiculous dream, and if events turn out in some way, if cardinals or prelates, for example, of their own free will or by surprise should enter into a part of our secrets, this is not at all an incentive for desiring their elevation to the See of Peter. That elevation would ruin us. Ambition alone would have led them to apostasy. The requirements of power would force them to sacrifice us. What we must ask for, what we should look for and wait for, as the Jews wait for the Messiah, is a pope according to our needs. With that, we shall march more securely towards the assault on the church than with the pamphlets of our brethren in France and even the gold of England. Do you want to know the reason for this? It is that with this, in order to shatter the high rock on which God built his church, we no longer need Hannibalian victor, vinegar, or need gunpowder, or even need our arms. We have little finger of the successor of Peter engaged in the ploy, and this little finger is as good as that for this crusade, as all the Urban the Seconds and all the St. Bernards in Christendom. Now then, to assure ourselves of a pope of the required dimensions, is a question first of shaping for this pope a generation worthy of the reign we are dreaming of. Leave old people and those of mature age aside. Go to the youth, and if it is possible, even to the children. End quote. Now that selection, which comes from several paragraphs of the document, always comes to mind whenever I see this kind of talk coming from the Vatican. It should be obvious why at this point. I frequently see people saying they think Francis is a member of the Lodge, but if the Lodges are using this document at all as a game plan, then there's no reason he would actually be a member, or any need to be. After all, all he has to be is a willing promoter of the ideas, which would make him more dangerous than being a member of the Lodge itself. And those ideas are everywhere in his statement. Humanism, fraternity, his push for egalitarianism and greater equality, the embrace of some aspects of liberation theology, all of these point back to the values of those who wrote the permanent instruction of the Alta Vendita. In a video message, Francis said the following, quote, A global educational pact is needed to educate us in universal solidarity and a new humanism. Now that's interesting. Notice how this isn't to get math scores up in the developing world, which would do wonders to help those countries develop in the long term. Nor is it a call to have education defend the various national cultures, which would actually promote global stability in a time when internal national tensions are becoming the norm across the Western world. No, it's a call for education to be used as a tool for propaganda, globalist propaganda. That's disturbing on a deep level because it does bring to mind the other image that I've used before when talking about this issue, the Tower of Babel, which according to sacred scripture was an attempt to unify all of humankind behind one grand secular purpose. The Vatican-themed website, which I've linked also on the Sources blog, said the following of this project. Quote, Educating young people in fraternity and learning to overcome divisions and conflicts promote hospitality, justice, and peace. Pope Francis has invited everyone who cares about the education of the young generation to sign a global pact. To create a global change of mentality through education. Francis adds the following. Quote, this will result in men and women who are open, responsible, prepared to listen, dialogue, and reflect with others, and capable of weaving relationships with families, between generations, and with civil society, and thus to create a new humanism. There it is again, humanism. Humanism was a movement that would call, that would call itself as a humanist later. 
but was confronted rather forcefully in the syllabus of errors, which promoted all kinds of things like the separation of church and state, moral relativism, secularism, and as of course, modernism. All these condemned in the syllabus. And that syllabus was, it was as described by one atheist site, all central to the project of human, the humanist movement. Those values, again, condemned by the syllabus of errors. Now, unless I'm wrong, I have to ask this question. Why is a pro-pope promoting humanism? After all, the church already has a long-term strategy for promoting global peace. The evangelization of peoples, the spread of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the pursuit of sanctity over vanity for all peoples, including and especially those leaders who typically are the ones who get the rest of us into situations of international and even global conflict. Let me be blunt and say something controversial. The globalist project for humanism and the gospel are at odds with one another. The core values are completely different. To illustrate that, I recommend actually reading the syllabus of errors. You know, on Saturdays, I typically record an audiobook form papal documents, but I probably won't do that with the syllabus since it's mostly a list of condemned statements, and that doesn't really lend itself well to audiobook form. But the core values of this humanism are all contained in that papal document, and the syllabus of errors is one of those documents considered magisterially infallible, which itself begs a lot of questions about a lot of figures in the church in the post-conciliar era. I'll close with this observation, and it was made by Archbishop Vigano in a recent interview he gave with Dr. Robert Moynihan. In that interview, Vigano said the same thing I'm saying here about the state of the church and the links between this and the permanent instruction of the Alta Vendita. According to Archbishop Vigano, the infiltration of the church is due, quote, in particular to the creation of the middle, eight, middle of the 1700s of Freemasonry. But of course, this project was very deceptive and oriented, or even included in some way, the forces of members of the church. He goes on to plug Taylor Marshall's book, Infiltration, which is also interesting, but he continues, quote, But this process became strikingly evident in modern times. This process of creating a new church, Vigano said, was started at the Second Vatican Council when the men we now call Council Fathers rejected the prepared documents for the Council and relied on new ones to be drafted by the likes of Karl Rahner, Hans Kung, and other modernists. Vigano says that is where it really started inside the church, but the efforts to turn the church into a secular organization promoting unchristian and even anti-Catholic values has been ongoing since the 1700s, and only gained a real foothold in the church in the past century. And you know, anytime I say this, people try to defend the council and whatnot, but really we need to stop defending the council. Archbishop Vigano was right, for the documents of the council lay the groundwork for this new humanism in the documents on religious liberty at the very least. And those documents fly right in the face of the faith. Cardinal Ratzinger, in a weird way, even agrees with Vigano on this, as he is one of the men often credited with calling the Second Vatican Council a counter-syllabus, that is, a council that undid or, re or made irrelevant the syllabus of errors. It's interesting that Pius IX published that document a hundred years before the council, and I'm sure that's not significant in any way either. So what do you think about all of this? Is it just me, or are things picking up speed as we move towards the Amazon Synod? Is this call for a new humanism through the propaganda force of education a scary sign, or am I just off my rocker? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you for listening. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.